Welcome everybody, my name is Andreas Meyer. I'm a professor of computer science at Friedrich Alexander University Erlangen Nuremberg and I'm very glad to be invited to your conference. So the big new discoveries in machine learning and the big progress that has been made over the last couple of years also inspired me to focus on the opportunities of using these technologies for image reconstruction. So I work a lot in the field of computer tomography, so quite a bit of x-rays, and you will see that many of the things that I'm presenting today are actually focusing on the technology of using x-ray computer tomography. Still, I think that most of the things that I'm showing today are also applicable in MR imaging. And if you look closely, you will see that we will also have many methods that have also been used in the field of MR imaging. So I'm very glad to have you here and to be given the opportunity to speak at your esteemed conference. And I want to welcome you to my presentation entitled Known Operator Learning, an approach to unite machine learning, signal processing and physics. So you can see that this work has been funded by several institutions, including the German Research Council and the ERC. So what do you want to present today? Well, I'll start with a brief introduction on the things that we are doing and the many things where we use machine learning in perceptive tasks. Then I want to give a brief introduction into the state of deep learning reconstruction. And I want to talk about a short idea where we use known operation in deep networks in order to be able to unite the worlds of machine learning and the worlds of image reconstruction. So typically the machine learning or deep learning techniques, they stem from perceptual tasks. And there you try to find something in an image, you try to find a pattern and you try to bring this pattern into a domain such that it can be processed by a computer and for example, help in decisions. One example that I have here, where we are also interested in doing essentially detection of organs or essentially anatomical landmarks in the body, is shown in this example. The idea here was that we wanted to mimic essentially how a radiologist looks at the image. And we essentially want to look at the image patch by patch and then use that information in order to detect that specific landmark. So the idea would be that you look into a specific region of the body and you're looking for a landmark and then step by step approach the direction that is correct to find that landmark. Of course, if you do that on a very coarse level, that's not sufficient. So you want to do that in a kind of multi-scale approach. So you zoom in and then you repeat and refine the current search. We're doing this using a reinforcement learning strategy. You may know this from different approaches that try to play, for example, Atari games with this kind of techniques. So we are kind of setting this into a game scenario where we try to make the move that maximizes our score. And here the score is essentially given by the closeness to the anatomical landmark. The nice thing with this is that we gradually approach the correct location and that we also get a path. So we can see what the algorithm did in order to find that landmark. And the nice thing is it really follows anatomical structures. And if you're missing the landmark, and then you can see that our trained algorithm tries to leave the volume. So here the hip bone is not part of the volume. And in virtually all cases that we investigated, we could demonstrate that we are not detecting landmarks that are not present of the volume. Obviously, if you had something like an organ removed surgically, we would still try to find it at the location where we would expect the organ. Well, there's also other approaches, of course, where you can use these deep learning technologies. And obviously, you can also apply this to projection imaging, not just volumetric imaging. And then you can do a view by view processing in order to detect anatomic landmarks in views. And here you can see that this is also very stable. It almost looks like tracking, but here we do the processing of each view independently. So also in 
real x-ray images that are not generated from simulations, we can see that this process also works robustly and reliable. And we believe that this kind of techniques can help us, for example, in motion compensation, if we are able to determine the difference of the actual gantry motion and the patient motion. So this is ongoing work. And here we have seen that for these perceptual tasks, deep learning techniques, machine learning techniques can be extremely powerful. So different people came up with the idea that you could use these technologies as well as for image reconstruction. And I want to show you a rather simple approach. So here you see an architecture that is called UNET, which is essentially the state of the art method for image segmentation. So if you want to outline organs, and it is generally a method that is able to transform general images to other images. So you could input images and produce segmentation masks, but you could also input images and produce artifact-free images. And this is an approach that was published rather early for doing image-based reconstruction, you could say. So this is not really inverting the inverse problem, but it's removing the artifacts that are created by different types of acquisition methods in the image domain. So here you see an example of a limited angle scan. This occurs if you're not able to rotate around the entire patient. And what we intend to do with the reconstruction method now is to do a partial reconstruction and then use this partial reconstruction, pass it to UNET and generate an artifact free image. And surprisingly, if you take the image on the left hand side and you train on a specific anatomy, but without ever having seen that specific patient, you can generate images like this. So you can see that the missing data is completed very nicely and it looks almost like a perfect reconstruction. Obviously, this raises some doubts. And I guess that's also the point of the conference here that we want to talk about the difficulties that occur. And here you can see work by my colleague Yixing Huang. And he started investigating what happens if you put in lesions, for example, into these images. So he put a lesion exactly in the rib cage, exactly in the location where we're missing the most data. And here you can see it on the left hand side, indicated by an arrow. In the bottom right, you see a blow up view of the lesion. And here you can see the input to the reconstruction algorithm. So you see this is a partial reconstruction and exactly in the area where we place the lesion, there is the most data missing. And you can see that we are essentially not observing the large edge that is essentially determining the limits of the rib cage. So here you can see in the bottom right that the lesion is there, but it's somewhat smeared and it's not very well visible. Now let's just see what happens. And you see the reconstruction returns this and the lesion is preserved. So we were very surprised by this result and could say, wow, that's actually pretty cool that the lesion is still preserved and that we can see it. And this is kind of promising. So we wanted to explore a bit of the limits. And what we found out very quickly is that one limitation is for all machine learning methods that your training conditions must match the test conditions. So only by adding a little bit of Poisson noise that would occur realistically in projection domain prior to the partial reconstruction, you get this. And you can already see here that it's not just that the lesion is gone, but because we're adding this noise, our reconstruction method is pretty much fooled away from what we actually observed. And you can see that the chest boundary is moved by approximately one centimeter and our entire lesion is gone. So that's for sure a weakness of these purely image-based methods. Well, what can we do? We can match again the training and test conditions and train in a scenario where we also supplied the same kind of noise during the training process of the machine learning method. And what happens is that our lesion is now restored. It's still there, but you can see it's much blurred compared to the previous version. So be very careful if you look into the publications with the machine learning reconstruction methods, things like this occur. And remember, all machine learning methods that are very popular today, virtually all of them work with reconstruction algorithms that are created by training from 
a local minimization technique, which means you can get stuck in a local minimum. And in one of the training runs, we produced a network that would do this. And here you can see that this kind of network is not converged to a very good local minimum. And it started producing an algorithm that would start drawing organ shapes also into the air behind the patient. So I hope you can see this. There are these like kidney or liver like shapes appearing in the air behind the patient. And this is for sure something that you want to avoid. Now, one big problem is that with the machine learning algorithms and their black box nature, it's very hard to give guarantees on that. This is why we revisited a bit of the machine learning theory and started into looking into approaches that would give us some guarantees or some interpretable models that we could work with. And this is what we came up with. So we wanted to know what would happen if we put something into the network where we already know that it's supposed to work. So we know it by theory, for example, it could be the geometry of the system or other things, and we want to embed it into the neural network. This brings us back to the so-called universal approximation theorem. The universal approximation theorem is a theory that tells us how accurately we can actually get in terms of a learning process with respect to the actual underlying function. So the function that we want to learn here is u of x. Now you see that we indicate x in boldface, which means it's a vector value and u generally here produces a scalar. Now you can see that and this function u can be approximated by a function capital U of x. And capital U of x is given as this superposition over factors s weighted with weights ui. And these factors s are essentially nonlinearities. So these are typically sigmoid functions that are used in order to approximate the function. So you see this dates back to the very basic machine learning theory. Generally, this needs to be a bounded function. And you can see that most of the nonlinearities that are very common today can be used in the universal approximation theorem. So there's also variants of this that can also work with rectified linear units and the modern activation functions. So we have some function s and into s you plug something that is essentially a projection. So here this is a projection onto some kind of hyperplane and you can compute some kind of sine distance. Then using the superposition using weights wi and the inner product with the original input x plus some bias, then pass through the nonlinearity and this superimposed by a linear combination of with weights ui will then give you the final prediction. So this is essentially one fully connected layer. And for this fully connected layer, we can show that there are bounds. And there is generally an upper bound for the approximation that is given as some epsilon u. And epsilon u, this is the general distance between capital U of x minus u of x. So this would give us then some epsilon u. And we can see that if we increase the number of neurons in that one hidden layer network, then also our error would shrink. And if we had close to infinitely many neurons in that layer, we could show that epsilon would approach zero. So the more neurons you have, the more capacity your network has, the better you can learn the underlying function. And obviously, this applies on a compact set and for a given training data set. Now, if you want to work with this, this is quite nice. But actually, we don't want to have this black box nature and we want to have more than a single hidden layer. So we want to apply this in much more complex situations. What we actually would be interested in is looking into networks that look like this. So here we have essentially fully connected layers or trainable layers. And then we embed operations where we already know that they are a good idea or we know from theory that they should be present. So we get a mix of different layers where we have known operators and unknown operators. And now we would be interested in the error bounds for this learning problem. Let's make it a little simpler and start with a two layer network. So here we have a network that is essentially composed of two layers. Here we have the two functions g and u. 
and u of x is a general vector to vector transform and g of u is then essentially a vector to scalar transform and we know by definition of f of x that we can write it as a composition of those two functions. This then enables us to explore different ways of approximating this. So we can either approximate u of x, we can approximate g, and this then gives us various different errors that can be introduced. So we can write here the capital F u of x that is given by the approximation of u and the true g and then we have the approximation fg which is given as the approximation of g and knowing the true u and we have the approximation f of x which approximates both of the functions so here we're using the approximations of g and u now if we do that we can see this introduces errors we can of course subtract the error from the true function and this would then give us the erroneous estimate. Now what we can do is we can try to use the definitions of the functions and plug them together and what we very quickly see is that we can of course use the definitions and relate the errors to each other but the key problem that emerges is that you see here already in line number three that the errors introduced by u of x they cannot be taken out of the nonlinearity S. So there is a nonlinear relationship here and we have troubles pulling this out. So we cannot directly relate the errors to each other, but what we can do, of course, is we can investigate bounds of this error. And in order to investigate the bounds, we're looking into the Lipschitz constants of the nonlinearities. And in particular, we are interested in bounds where we then have essentially the maximum slope known of the nonlinearity or the specific function. This can typically be determined for the functions that we have under consideration and we can use them to produce upper bounds. I want to save you the derivation of the complete bound here. I just want to convey you the idea that we're using maximum slopes and so on. And this allows us to derive bounds. And now if you look at these bounds for the simple problem, you can already see that it is essentially a sum and it is a sum over the different components in U. So each component in U produces an error and this is amplified with the Lipschitz constant Ls and this is multiplied with the weight gj of the linear combination in our layer. So you can see this is essentially the error of u. If we would know u, the error would be zero and this part of the error term would collapse and then it's added to the error that is produced by g. So these are the two functions and if we use those two functions then we essentially end up with an additive error. So that's pretty cool because this is something that we can work with. If we know u, the u error cancels out. If we know g, the g error cancels out. If we know everything, the error shrinks to zero, which is also a very nice property. You can also put this in relation with classical machine learning where you would interpret u as the feature extractor and g as the classifier. Things that you never extracted in the feature extractor cannot be fixed by the classifier, so these errors propagate. We also see that here. And as a general reminder, remember that we need Lipschitz continuity here in order to be able to use this theory. We can extend this to deep networks, and this is the case that we're actually interested in. And of course, the theory can also be applied. We end up with a slightly different bound here. We then end up with a sum over the layers. So you see that if you know the individual layers, their respective error cancels out to be zero, and you have to multiply with the respective Lipschitz constants. And we are also able to show that this kind of error term holds. So everything that we do here will also apply for deep learning methods. And we were quite glad that we could publish this in Nature Machine Intelligence.
So let's put this to use. And again, I have an example from CT reconstruction here. You remember, you take these projection images, then you reconstruct volumes like this one. So we do slice by slice volumes. The signal generation is rather easy in terms of math because you essentially observe sums along the rays. And with these sums, you then can set up a system of linear equations where we have the different voxels and the respective ray sums. You can rewrite this and then find a solution. So this would be a suitable solution here. And generally, it is the solution of a large system of linear equations. Now here, it becomes very similar to the MR reconstruction. Here, your A would essentially be a Fourier transform. And in our case, it is a slightly different operation. What's a bit different in many 3D applications is that this operator is really large. So if you do CT reconstruction of a whole volume, you typically have many unknown variables already for a 512 cubed volume, you have the 134 million unknown parameters. And that would then also mean that this operator is really large. So if you would want to instantiate A in memory in floating point precision for a 3D problem, then you would easily end up with 65,000 terabytes of memory. And obviously, this would be infeasible, in particular, if you want to invert this matrix for the solution, because you measure the projections and not x, right? There is an efficient solution known by Johan Radon already since 1917. And of course, you know that this has been implemented successfully also in practice. The solution is found as the so-called filtered back projection algorithm. This is a view by view filtering and then a sum over all the angles. And this can be implemented very, very efficiently using ray casting methods. So we can implement A and A transpose very efficiently. And this then leads to the solution that you can also write up in terms of linear algebra. So the Radon solution could be expressed here as a transpose times a matrix that needs to be inverted. So this is a, a transpose inverted. And turns out that the inversion of that particular matrix gives you a circulant matrix, which is nothing else than a convolution. And this is our filtered back projection algorithm. So if you want to implement this in terms of neural networks, you would do it like this. You would have a convolutional layer, the filter a back projection that is a fully connected layer, and then you have some non-negativity constraints. So this would be the parallel beam reconstruction algorithm. Now, actually, we don't need to train anything here because we know all of the weights. So we know everything from filtered back projection. So this is probably not what we want to do exactly, but we can expand this, for example, for fan beam problems that we then have an additional multiplicative weight that has to come in, which is known as the cosine weights. If you have a short scan, this then also includes so-called Parker weights. And this is essentially a matrix that is just a pointwise multiplication. Now, the cool thing about this is we can use this as a kind of pre-training, as you would call it in the machine learning world, and instantiate the matrices accordingly. We are not touching the operator A transpose in this case because it's too large to be implemented in memory. It is a sparse matrix, but we never implement it here. So we can just treat it as fixed. And we know in the back projection pass, we just need the transpose. So we can essentially use ideas that you already know from iterative reconstruction in the training process here. And this allows us to make this method here trainable. And if this method is trainable, then we can also use it for geometries that cannot be solved in a straightforward way using a filtered back projection type of technique. So let's do that. This is a full reconstruction. Now, this is again a limited angle reconstruction, not as hard as the one that I showed in the beginning. So here we are only missing 20 degrees. So this is a fan angle of 20 degrees and a scan of 180 degrees. So we are missing 20 degrees of data acquisition. And you can see that this already produces severe artifacts. Now we can take this and train our method. And what it produces are images like this. So if you compare here, you can see that the artifacts are largely reduced with the trained method. 
The nice thing about this approach is that it's still a filtered back projection method, which means that we can look at the parts of the network that have been changed and interpret them in their original domain. It turns out that these are largely the redundancy weights that I talked about earlier. And in particular, the one that you see on the left hand side, these are the Parker weights that I talked about. And you can see here on the right hand side, how the network started adjusting the weights. And we found that already in 2016. And in 2017, actually colleagues from Philips came up with a heuristic that looks like the one in the center here. And you can see that what we found is very similar to the heuristic proposed by the colleagues from Philips. And we can show that the right hand side solution is data optimal, while they essentially have a kind of argument why their weights should work. So they're increasing the weight in the areas where they're losing mass. So it makes sense. And you can see that what we get from the training is very similar, and it could potentially help us to find also interpretations why the specific solutions are useful. Now, what I talked about is essentially filter back projection and a lot of CT stuff. We are very sure that this can also be applied to iterative methods and we already did that and this is essentially now a cooperation with Kerstin Hamanek and Thomas Pock where we mapped an iterative method also into a neural network. Here we choose an energy minimization formulation and essentially a compressed sensing type of reconstruction where you have essentially the data term on the left hand side and the sparsification regularizer on the right hand side and now we make this regularizer trainable. If you do that then you can see that you typically apply let's say 10 iterations so you compute the gradient of this energy minimization and loop it for 10 iterations and this gives you essentially the setup for the actual optimization with 10 fixed iterations. So this is like loop unrolling. And this way we are able to generate a network that will solve the specific problem. And by doing so, we can now use techniques from neural network training in order to compute updates for the actual training algorithm. So we can make the matrix K, which is essentially the sparsification matrix here, trainable. So we can see that this is compatible with our previous approach. So we have the image domain reconstruction. So from raw data to image domain using our trainable filter back projection, and then a couple of additional repeatable steps of our data consistent iterative updates. And you see that this emerges then in the following network structure. And you can see that this is essentially an image domain iterative reconstruction that is also been applied in CT reconstruction before. The nice thing is it's trainable and we can make it trainable to compensate for specific artifacts that appear in this type of data. And if you look at the results, then you see that we can have here the full scan reference on the top left. You see that our remaining neural network from the filter back projection still has streaks on the top right. And now if we apply this kind of image domain artifact reduction, data consistent artifact reduction, you can see that we get results like on the bottom right. So the streaks are largely reduced while preserving the optimal closeness to the original reconstructed data. And if you compare that to a general denoising approach, you can see on the bottom left, this would not be able to suppress the streaks as efficiently. Now, prior knowledge could be also very other things. So what we also did is we looked at segmentation algorithms. And here we can then pick heuristics like the frangi vesselness filter and make parts of that filter also trainable. Everything that allows you to integrate gradients that has steps where you can compute gradients or subgradients on is essentially compatible with this approach. The big advantage is that we have much fewer parameters than the traditional deep methods that have millions of parameters. Here we can show that we only have approximately 1% of the original parameters. And we can get segmentation approaches here that are as efficient as unit. The interesting thing here is that if you design your network in an appropriate way, you can even make them re reusable. So here we have a paper where we suggested to essentially have 
an auxiliary loss that forces in the pre-processing stage the input and the output of the pre-processing to be similar and then we train a unit here and apply a FrangiNet filter afterwards and with this we can show that we get on par results with deep learning methods in terms of segmentation so we can show that the vesselness filter is essentially sufficient the quite old 1998 paper is as good as a deep network if you apply appropriate pre-processing so that's already a pretty good result second the image characteristics are preserved so it really looks still like an image so we're essentially performing denoising sharpening and so on so we remain in the image domain by choosing this appropriate loss here and you see that the original input of this vessel image here so this is an eye background so it's very different but we could show this at least for the retina in this particular data you have image a that goes into the network actually it's not image a but image b because we only take the green channel and you see that the green channel still has noise and artifacts and there's also the illumination which is a problem c is the output of our deep network that is then processed by the frangi filter and you see that the result of the segmentation with the frangi filter is on par with deep learning methods so because we can compute the gradient through the frangi filter we can update the prior network in order to create the optimal image that is still similar to the input but optimal for segmentation with respect to the frangi filter so that's pretty cool imagine not putting a unit here but a reconstruction method so we can now combine all these things because we can make reconstructions trainable we can make the segmentation methods trainable and then essentially use losses as interfaces at intermediate steps now the cool thing with this one is this is reusable we applied this so here is fundus so it's a photograph of the eye background and then there's also a method that is called OCTA so this is OCT angiography which is a very different scanning modality where you essentially compute something similar to an ultrasound image of the eye background so it's a 3D image then we project onto the surface and we analyze the noise that is in each voxel and this gives you a measure for the presence of blood flow in every voxel and this is being used to create contrast free angiography now because we trained our method in a way that it produces images that look like the input this is a general pre-processing method so we can apply it also to a very different modality so this is OCTA so it's a completely different contrast but we can still use this pre-processing network and plug it into our processing chain and what you see here on the left hand side is the original noisy OCTA method and then we processed the left hand side with our pre-processing network module without any fine tuning just take the network apply it on the OCTA projection data which is also 2D and shows similar anatomy so that's very important but we can apply it and get drastically improved image quality so if you compare the left hand side and the center which is the output it is much improved and you see all the tiny vessel details and now on the right hand side you see a blend of the two so this is a 50 percent blend and we even validated this now with high resolution OCTA data and could show that this is a very efficient method for denoising and preserving real vessel detail so that's pretty amazing that we can make steps reusable across modalities just because they show the same anatomy at a similar resolution so that's pretty cool what else can be done well we can even go ahead and reuse this idea of the known operators and talk a bit about geometry and deriving algorithms so let's say you want to create some projection images typically in radiography they are in a cone beam geometry so you have divergent rays and they hit the detector in orthopedics 
you would not like to have this. You would like to have parallel projections, but you can't acquire the parallel projections with a typical X-ray source. So that's not possible. But you can understand both geometries and we know the projection operators ACB, which is the cone beam, and APB, which is the parallel beam matrix. So both of them can be used. We have some unknown object X that is projected into those two geometries. Now we can go ahead and although we can't measure the parallel beam projection, we can take a couple of cone beams, reformulate the problem here, solve for X and put the solution of X into the regridding of our cone beam data to parallel beam data. Now there's this ugly inverse in there. Now we just postulate that it needs to be something like a convolution. So we use this trick that we had from filter back projection and we just claim it needs to be a filter. So we replace it with a Fourier transform, a diagonal matrix K and an inverse Fourier transform. And voila, you have your new network topology and all you need to estimate are the parameters of K, which is much fewer than you actually need. Obviously, this can also be applied to nonlinear formulas. And now I want to go back to MR and talk a bit about a hybrid system that we have been researching on a little bit. And the problem also occurs, of course, if you want to pair MR data and X-ray projection data. So let's say you would have an X-ray source within an MR gantry. Then you could, of course, generate projection images using the X-ray device, but the rays would never align with the inherently parallel geometry that is created by the MR scanner. So here we essentially use the same idea, but now we want to sample essentially projections and MR and map them into a cone beam geometry such that it can immediately be overlaid on the X-ray projection so that we could show MR contrasts on the X-ray projection images in real time. So live MR overlays for X-ray imaging, for example, for image guidance. Now, if you would do that, you would end up with something like this shown in this video here. So let me show this with projection independent filters. So the idea here is that we just have one filter that is applied essentially to every radial spoke and then directly converted into the geometry of the X-ray image. Now here you can see on the left hand side we start with the RAM filter that would be the solution if we would have a complete scan. Obviously this is incorrect in our case here. And note that we are only training with simulated data that contains ellipses, spheres, their superposition and noise and only training on synthetic data, we immediately apply this here on the right hand side for the rebinning of the projection data. And you can here see already that if we do that on the right hand side with an anthropomorphic phantom, so an anatomy that has never been seen in the training process, you can see here that you get a pretty bad image quality. Now, if we run a bit over the iterations and again, on the synthetic training, you see how the artifacts disappear also in the anthropomorphic scan and you get much, much nicer images. So here we have in particular much sharper images than we would get from any other rebinning method that we are aware of today. And you see that as we reduce the error in our training process, the error in the anthropomorphic data also is reduced and we get very decent image quality. So this is interesting. Obviously, we can also do this with different weights for every projection. So we have then 15 projections and now we train different weights for each projection and iterate again on the simulated data. And again, on the right hand side, you can see how the image quality is improved and how we get much, much better projections that are then in the same geometry as we would have it in the X-ray projection directly sampled from the MR scanner. Of course, this is work in progress. There's many more things that have to be solved. Also, the acquisition is kind of challenging. And note that if you 
know how you're acquiring case space, then you could even go this far that you're optimizing the case space sampling trajectory such that it is optimal with respect to the produced X-ray overlay or cone beam overlaid MR image. So I think these methods have tremendous potential. We have a huge reduction of the search space because we can embed the known operators. And this then also allows us to build things that are trained on synthetic data and generalize much better than any of the blind black box deep learning methods that we are aware of today. So I hope I could convince you that many traditional approaches are mathematically equivalent to neural networks and vice versa. And this then means that we can include traditional algorithms into learning algorithms. Many of them can be employed, even things like median filters and so on can be embedded into the training process if you use subgrading techniques. So there you do then linear approximations of the local gradient, which is also fine. And we could show that is successful during the training process. And the nice thing if you do so is that the learned parameters can be mapped into the original interpretation. So you can also read them, you can interpret them. They are essentially traditional algorithms, but with different parameter adjustments. And you can see that virtually most state-of-the-art reconstruction, segmentation, and image analysis methods can be implemented here. And if you design the networks in an appropriate way, you can even make them reusable. So I think this is a very strong approach if you don't want to train everything from scratch, but you want to have parts of the network that are interpretable and reusable. So I think this is a very nice approach. So I hope I could convince you that this is maybe a strategy to go forward in the future. Obviously, I'm not doing this alone. You will also see that many colleagues also here presenting on the workshops are already using these techniques. And I think this is a very good way to proceed. And we are collaborating also in a worldwide network. Well, I would like to thank you for your attention. I also have some references here on this slide. If you want to read some of the papers that I presented here, you can find them here with the full reference. So all that remains now is that I want to thank you for your attention, that you watch the video all to the end. And of course, I will be also in presence for discussions. You can reach me on social media, you can email me, and I'm very glad to take any questions that may come up regarding this presentation. So thank you very much for listening and bye-bye.